Namaste everyone. Let's start our Tuesday class with the Vedic prayers. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwaraha, Guru Sakshat Parbrahma, Tasme Shri Guru Venamaha, Om Bhubhava Swaha, Tatsavitra Vareneyam, Margo Deva Sedhi Mahi, Diyo Yonaha Prachodayat. Asto ma satgamya, tamso ma jyotir gamya, mrityor ma amritam gamya. Om sehna vavtu, sehna bhunaktu, seh viryam karva vahi. He jasvi navadhi tamastu ma vidvesha vahi. Om shanti 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 yo. So on Tuesdays we read Mahabharata. And we are on the chapter where it says Giri Vrajya. And last time when we were reading this, we saw that Lord Krishna, Bhim, and Arjuna, they go to Giri Vrajya. Okay. So that is the place where Jarasandh lived. So let's see how this story takes us further. Disguised as Sanat Brahmans who know the Vedas, Young men who have completed their gurukulam but are not grist householders yet. Krishan, Bhim, and Arjun set out from Indraprasth. They cross the deep Saryo and the swift Gandhaki and the solemn Kalkut mountains on their way east to Mithila. They arrived at the borders of Mithila and saw the Ganga laden with men's sins flowing out to her lord, the ocean. They forded her in a tribal's reed boat, and they went south until they came to the banks of the Sona, whose waters are golden. Crossing that river and pressing on, they arrived in fertile, bountiful Magadha. They struck out into the heart of that land, where a ring of five hills called the Gorath, chariot of cows, encircled the great city, Girivraj the invincible Jarasans captain. They stood on one of the peaks that ringed the city and saw why Girivraj was impregnable. It was impossible to bring a horse or chariot to attack it. Only a winged steed could cross the guardian hills that fell sheerly into the valley in which Girivraj lay. Krishna said grimly, it is the enemy's fortress. We must be full of aggression. Now, he tore some rocks off the Chatyak hill on which they stood and hurled them down into the valley below. Bhim and Arjun joined him until their Kshatriya blood raged and their roar fairly into the valley and to the city gates. Like three dangerous beasts of prey, Krishan, Arjun, and Bhima came to Girivraj. Just outside the city stood a stone temple, an ancient shrine to Shiva. The three Kshatriyas entered its sanctum and worshipped the god of gods. When they felt his blessing clearly, they came out and approached Girivraj. They did not enter at the gates, but scaled the outer walls, and soon three unusual Sanat Brahmans were swaggering through the streets of Jarasam's capital looking for trouble. They snatched some garlands off a flower vendor's stall, and when he began to re remonstrate with them, they silenced him with a low growling in their throats. They did not pay for the garlands or say a word. With the garlands draped around their sandal and ash-coated bodies, they walked colorfully through the streets. People stared at the strangers who were dressed like a sanats, but had the physiques and the haughty demeanor of Kshatriyas spoiling for a fight. Like a pride of lions, the three sauntered through Grivraj, daring anyone to accost them. Meanwhile, evil omens appeared over the city. The Brahmins who read these signs saw birds of the air flying queerly in wheeling and pain-stricken swarms. Sacrificial fires spluttered and died. Purulent smoke issued from the ambush. The priests grew alarmed and turning to their almanacs, 
found the planets were in precarious aspects. The Brahmins came anxiously to the king and said, Sinister omens have gathered over Girivraj's destiny. You must perform Amritanchya home at once. Your life is in danger. Jarasan said, Make arrangements in the palace temple. I will come there straight away. Even as the king of Magad sat at the ritual, meant to turn death away, three warriors come to kill him arrived at his opulent palace. They did not enter at the gates. He was their enemy, and a Kshatriya must never enter an enemy's house openly, but by stealth. Again, they scaled the walls and stalked into Jarasan's chamber of audience in guise, garlanded and smeared with ashes and sandal paste. Word came to the king that three Sadak Brahmins sought audience with him. His guard told Jarasan of the trio's unusual entry into his palace. The king sent them madhupark, milk, and honey and asked them to wait for him. It was midnight when the home was completed and Jarasan came to meet the visitors who had aroused his curiosity. He bowed to the strangers. His shrewd eyes appraised them. He saw their Brahmins attire, sandal paste and saffron garments, tall tilaks on their foreheads. He also saw the marks on their muscled arms made by bow strings. He saw how splendidly they were built and knew these were no Brahmins but Kshatriya warriors. But he said warmly, welcome to Girivraj. It is strange that Sanatats come to my palace wearing sandal paste and garlands. It is stranger they chose to enter by scaling my walls. This isn't the way that friends arrive. And friends, you refuse the Madhupark I sent you. Yet you are welcome. I see warriors' physiques under your ash and sandal paste, battle scars on your skin, and the marks of bow strings on your shoulders. I wonder if you are Brahmins or Kshatriyas. But whoever you are, you are welcome in Girivraj. Krishna smiled. It is indeed the friend who enters at the gate and the enemy that comes over the wall. The Kshatriyas is not known for sweet words, but his deeds. We have come to challenge you. Jarasandh peered at them in the lamplight. But who are you? Why do you want to challenge me? When I do not recall ever having harmed you, you say you are my enemies. How can you be my enemies when I have not set eyes on you before? I have many enemies, certainly, but none that I have never seen. Tell me who you are. Krishna replied, you have made prisoners of 98 kings and you mean to slaughter them in Shiva's name. We are your enemies because you want to sacrifice his kshatriyas like animals. I have defeated every king in my prison in battle. Their lives are mine in Dharam. He still peered curiously at them in the deep night. The certainty grew on him that he had seen the strangers spokesman before. He knew that ash and sandal coated face and those black eyes full of transcendent mockery, he cried, but tell me who you are and where you have come from. Krishan said softly, I am Krishna of Dwarka. These are my cousins, Bhim and Arjun. We have come to tell you to let the captive kings go free or face any of us in single combat. Of course, if you are not afraid to, after the Yadavs routed your 18 times outside the Mutra. Jarasan's eyes blazed. Then he began to laugh. A silent shaking of his great body, which turned to echoing peals. There is more than one version of those 18 battles. <clears throat> People say, for fear of me, you hide out at sea behind Rivatek. Yet you come here to challenge me in Grivraj. The thought is amusing, cowhide. <clears throat> His eyes glinted. Krishna, you dare come here and tell me what I should do with my prisoners. Have you forgotten who I am? Cowherd, I am Jarasand. I fear no one in the world and no one has ever vanquished me. You have come to your death, sir. Tell me, how shall we fight? Army against army or hand to hand? How many of you will fight me at once? All of you? Two at least? Or were you thinking of sending home for some more brothers and cousins if I agreed to fight you? Still smiling equably, Krishna said, choose one of us, Kshatriya, which one will you fight? 
जरा सन सुनिए डरते हैं यू विल बी पुअर इंटागनिस्ट ऑल ऑफ यू यू कृष्ण आर ए नोन कावर्ड आई विल नॉट फाइट यू This Arjun, who sits beside you like a fawning puppy, is just a boy. I am not in the habit of doing battle with children. As for this big fellow here, well, at least he looks like a man. He seems well built enough, so the fight may not be entirely one-sided. Bhim, I will fight you, and if I win, let both your kingdoms become mine. If I lose, my kingdom will be yours. Arjun and Bhim glanced at Krishna. Who nodded? Bhim said nothing. He rose and bowed, accepting the Magdhan's challenge. Now he had seen the enemy, felt his awesome presence and power. Bhim was more circumspect, but Jarasandh, who had never known fear in his life, felt a shiver of terror, terror in his blood. He said quickly, "Rest well tonight, enemies, and tomorrow we shall fight. After I have killed Bhim, both Indraprasth and Dwarka." Will be mine, and you shall be my subjects. Tonight is your last night of freedom. Is there anything I can send you to make your night warm? Krishna replied, "Just a bed will do." Jarasand insisted, "You are my guest, sir. I could not have hoped for greater fortune than your coming here like this, especially you, cowherd. You shall have wine and the best food in all Bharatwarsh, the finest women too. Enjoy them, Bhim. This is your last night in the world. We begin at noon." Tomorrow, he rose abruptly and left them. Warm indeed was Jarasandh's hospitality, and while the two Pandavas and Krishna were awash on it, later that night Jarasandh himself attended an unusual ceremony. He had his son Sahadev crowned king of Magadh. He could not stop thinking of the omens seen in his city, and icy foreboding laid its fingers on his heart. But when he came to fetch his guests the next day at noon. No trace of fear remained on the Magdhan. He was just a superb Kshatriya now. His mighty body oiled and glistening for the day's combat. His confidence supreme. After all, despite the omens, who could possibly know how he, whom Jara had joined, could be killed? He was convinced no one knew that secret, and so no one could kill him. The blade of grass. The next day at noon, Jarasandh led Bhim to a court courtyard in his palace, and a wrestling pit full of white river sand. The Magdhan said, "Which weapon do you prefer?" The mace replied Bhim. A selection of the finest maces were was fetched, and Jarasandh allowed Bhim first choice. Krishna smiled. It is a pity you flung away the mace that made you. Invincible. I have it in my palace in Dwarka. I am still invincible, Kaur, and that mace will shortly be mine again, and your Dwarka along with it. It was time to begin, and maces clutched in hands powerful as thunderbolts. The giant combatants began to circle each other. The sieved sand sparkled like crushed diamonds under their feet. With a roar that welled from his belly, Bhim struck out wildly at Jarasandh's head. Quicker than the eye, the king evaded the stroke, and Bhim staggered forward a step. In a flash, Jarasandh swung a sharp half blow at him from behind. It crashed into Bhim's back, and he almost fell. And if he had fallen, Jarasandh's next blow would have killed him. <coughs> But the legs of the son of the wind were as strong as trees. Bhim swiveled on his heels and struck back at Jarasandh. A looping blow that began near the Pandav's feet curved up and took the Magdhan smartly on his arm, catching a cry from him. Jarasandh roared, "You are strong, Pandav, and not half as dull as you look. This may turn out to be a better fight than I had thought." <coughs> Bhim kept his eyes fixed on his adversaries. Ignoring what he said, just as his master had taught him to, the eye Balram had told him never lies. Like two beasts from the earth's dim past, they circled in tense ritual, always seeking an opening to strike at. It would would be an instant's relaxation, a fleeting weakness. That was all, because these two were great mace fighters. But that moment was all they would need to make a kill. 
Patiently, they circled. After his first blind swing, no further rashness came from him. The thought sobered him that if he had fallen, it would have been an end to everything. As they circled, they seemed to grow in stature until they towered over the white arena. Like a summer lightning, Jarasandh aimed a savage stroke at Bhim's chest. Now Bhim was a blur of evasion and quick as thinking. He struck back at the Magdhan. Just in time, Jarasandh raised his mace and saving his face. The two maces burst apart with the force of that blow and Jarasandh's laughter rang through his palace. Well done, Pandav. I shall enjoy this duel. Fetch us more maces or would you rather fight hand to hand? Bhim stood there and not a word out of him, but his eyes shone as brightly as Jarasandh's. He raised his arms in front of his chest to show he was ready to fight barehanded. Again, they circled, wearily changing their inner rhythms, adapting to the new form of combat. They knew it would be a serious mistake to imagine that fighting barehanded would be less dangerous than with maces. Both Kshatriya's hands were weapons hardened with years of striking rocks, crushing them. A blow from those hands could fell not just a man, but an elephant. Meanwhile, their roars had fetched the people from the streets of Kiriviraj to the Westling Arena. Word flashed through the city that their king and a stranger were battling to the death with their kingdom set as a stake. The people, Brahmans, Kshatriyas, Vaishya, Sudras, and even women and the aged came running to watch the stranger die. It was seldom nowadays that anyone came to challenge Jarasandh. This stranger must be a fool or he must be tired of his life. But as they arrived, they heard whispers that it was their old enemy Krishan who had come to challenge their king. And his cousin Bhim was the one Jarasandh was fighting. Soon they saw how evenly the two were matched. Why, if Jarasandh had been any other Kshatriya, Bhim would have been killed him by now. But Jarasandh had a boon from the Lord Shiva that he could be killed in just one way. And of course, no one knew that secret. This was the first day of the month of Karthik. The combatants had used a hundred holes and locks, vicious kicks to the murmurs of the body and blows, flat-handed and closed-fisted, all at stunning speed. And of these would have killed any other opponent except three or four men on earth. But Bhim and Jarasandh knew the proper block and parry for each blow, every kick and iron lock, and no harm came to either. With the lowered heads, they butted one another like fighting rams and shuddered with the impacts. They kicked each other with feet like thunder and blows like whiplash lightning, and invariably these fell harmlessly on other parts of the body than they were meant to. Both were gifted, superbly trained, and each stronger than a bull bison. In different ways, neither of their strengths was merely human. The noise of their duel was like electric storms, like cliffs crumbling into the sea. At dusk, a conch blared, announcing an end to the day's combat. The warriors embraced each other and left the arena, and the crowd dispersed. And now Jarasan, the ferocious antagonist, was transformed into the most gracious host. The adversaries returned to the Magdhan king's palace for night-long revelry and the cordial exchange of the drunken pleasantries and insults. Late that night, Arjun said wryly to Krishna, this enemy is a better host than most of our friends. Full of the delectable wine served at Jarasan's table, cosseted by the loveliest women from his harem, Krishna agreed with feeling, may Bhim kill him slowly over many days. So it turned out for 26 days, all that month of Karthik, the two titans fell at each other for three hours every afternoon. With the maces, they swiftly broke and then with bare hands. Each day at dusk, they returned to the palace bruised, often bloody, returned to the dice and wine, delicious food, song and dance, uninhibited gaiety and the most luscious women. Indeed, it seemed that with every day, the two Kshatriya's spirits improved. 
Krishna said to Arjun, I see now why this Asur is such a favorite of Shiva's. 26 days and his hospitality and generosity continue unabated. The dark one sighed. He is a magnificent Kshatriya. But at crack of dawn on the 27th day of the fluctuating duel, Krishna came to see his cousin Bhim in his room. Bhim had grown strangely close to the Lord of Kiriviraj, as if the fight to death they waged daily bound them together with invisible arms. Krishna said, tomorrow is Amavasya, the day he has been waiting for. His kind is the strongest when the moon is new. You must kill him today, Bhim, or he will kill you tomorrow. Watch me for a sign and I will show you how to finish him. It is time he died, or Yudhishthir will never perform the Rajsuya and your father will remain in Yam's labyrinth. For Pandu and Yudhishthir, for the kings in his dungeons, who I believe are a hundred now, and for this earth who has borne his burden for too long, you must kill Jarasandh today. Bhim smiled. I have grown fond of him. He is great-hearted, but he is old and he is tiring. I will kill him, Krishna, for your sake as well as for all the others. Bhim knelt at Krishna's feet and the dark one blessed him. Five sets of maces were quickly shattered that afternoon. The king and his palace guests fell on each other with bare hands, yet they were more cautious than ever both conserving their ebbing energy, only the one who endured will live. Suddenly, Bhim began to feel unaccountably strong, as if someone was infusing him with unearthly power. With this new strength, he swung an iron fist at the Magdhan. Caught unawares by a sickening blow, Jarasandh fell with a cry. In a flash, flash Bhim was on him. His knee planted on his enemy's chest, his vast hands around his throat to choke life out of him. Jarasan's face turned purple, but he did not die. At last, Bhim released the thick throat and turned desperately to Krishna. Jarasan sat up laughing and struck Bhim a dreadful blow. Bhim rolled and sprang forward to clinch with him. Now the Pandav was full of doubt as they circled and immense arms locked. Bhim knew he had been within a whisker of killing Jarasan, but he had not died. When Bhim had choked him for so long, that his heart must have stopped beating. As they circled, breathing heavily, Bhim saw Krishna smiling at him. The avatar held a blade of grass in his hands and he tore it along its length. The strange strength cursed through Bhim's arms again. He understood the meaning of the blade of grass. In a blur, he tripped Jarasand into the sand. Damp with his sweat, quick as thinking, he seized the king's ankles, one in each hand. Jarasan's eyes flew open in shock, and a roar of alarm erupted from his lips. Bhim tore that king in two from his anus to his crown, and his steaming intestines, his feces, heart, liver, spleen, all his innards spilled onto the white sand. The crowd was petrified that the impossible had happened. Jarasan was dead. Bhim gave a roar of triumph. He ran to Krishan and Arjun to embrace them. But there was the queerest look in Krishna's eyes. And as Bhim flung his arms around his cousin, he heard a sound that froze his blood. The crowd was shouting its king's name again. Jarasand, Jay, Jarasand. Slowly Bhim turned and his cry of terror at what he saw in the wrestling pit echoed across the city. The torn hairs of Jarasand's body had joined themselves together. All his Spilt organs had packed themselves into the place again. There was a flash of light, like the one when a Jara, the Rakshasi, once joined two pieces of a baby together and gave a huge prince life. The Lord of Magadh rose from the dead and laughing as if the tearing of his body had been a delightful chest, he advanced on Bhim again. Bhim stood rooted. Wasn't it possible then to kill this terrible thing? What point was it fighting if the demon would not die after being torn in two? As the grinning Jarasand beckoned to him to come into a clinch again, Bhim turned in despair to Krishna. Arjun looked as mortified as his brother did, but Krishna stood smiling as if nothing extraordinary had happened.
He held another blade of grass in his hands. Who knew where he had come by a blade of grass? As Bhim watched him, amazed, again Krishna ripped the green blade in two. And now he crossed his hands and threw the torn halves in opposite directions. Once more Bhim felt the eerie strength surge through him. He leapt back into the wrestling pit and charged Charasam. The king was taken aback. He had thought the Pandav's nerve would break when he saw that Jarasand of Magad rose from the dead. Bhim seized him and hefting his bulk over his head began to whirl him around. Jarasand roared with laughter. Prepare to die when you have finished your little game. Bhim let him down suddenly and seized his ankles, planting his foot at the fork of his leg. Bhim tore him into again in a flash. <clears throat> so he had no time even to scream. Out spilled the warm and bloody innards. Bhim stood panting, still holding one half of the giant body in each hand. He glanced uncertainly at Krishna. Krishna crossed his wrists. Crossing his arms, Bhim flung the two body halves in opposite directions. So each one lay with its back to the other. Now they did not join and Jarasam did not rise from the dead. His people shouted to him to come back, not to abandon them. O oh, great king, the pieces of his corpse did not even twitch. That king, Lord Shiva's Bhagat, would never rise again. Krishna's celebrant cry rang through Grivraj, the roar of triumphant God. Now he ran to embrace Bhim, who collapsed exhausted in the dark one's arms. They paid the dead king every homage, but there was panic in the palace of Kiritaj. Panic gripped the ministers and courtiers. What would become of them? The customary shock that follows the death of a mighty sovereign seized the city and the streets of mourning. The people knew their kingdom had been the stake for the duel. Would Magad become part of Indra Trust? Would Yudhishthir come to rule Girivaraj? Or would Bhim or Arjun become its kings? Krishna's first concern was for the hundred royal captives. He had them released from the fitted catacomb under the palace where Jarasandh held them. When those Kshatriyas emerged into the clean night air, they saw dark Krishna effulgent and four armed before them, and they knelt before him. When they had thanked him repeatedly for saving them from being brutally sacrificed, they asked what they could do for him in return. Krishna said, it is Bhim who saved you. His brother Yudhishthir wants to perform a Rajasuya Yagya and become emperor of Bharatvash. See, you give him your sword. The hundred swore Yudhishthir is already our emperor. Krishna turned his mind back to Girivraj at midnight of the day. His father was torn in two by Bhim, Jarasan's eldest son, Another Sahadev found himself king in Magad. No condition was attached to his kingship, except that he recognized Yudhishthir as his emperor and ally. Jarasan's ministers retained their positions of influence. Having achieved the impossible in Grivraj, Krishna set out for Indraprast with an exuberant beam and Arjun, and the chariots laden with the gold and jewels that Sahadev sent with them. When they arrived at the gates of Indra the three of them raised their sea conches and blew clear on blasts on them. So the walls of that city shook. Yudhishthir came out from his palace, tears streaming down his face. He hugged his brothers and his cousin. This is a miracle, Krishna. We could have never killed Jarasandha without you. Krishna replied, don't bark at the Rajsuye anymore. Yudhishthir made them recount the battle between Bhim and Jarasan day by day, blow by blow, again and again, as if he could never hear enough about the enemy's strength and Bhim's valor. And Bhim never tired of telling the part when he had the shock of his life. When after he had torn Jarasan in two, the first time his body joined itself together, the king stood laughing at the founder. That is when I was sure everything was lost. Then he would sigh, but Krishna was with me and Jarasan's time had come. Krishna said to Yudhishthir, I must go back to Dwarka and you must send your legions to the four quarters. With your brothers leading them, 
Declare yourself emperor of Bharatvarsh and collect tribute from all the kingdoms for your sacrifice. With Jarasandha dead and a hundred kings already having sworn allegiance to you, your task will not be hard. When Bhim Arjun Sahadev and Nakul ride home in triumph, I will also come with the Yadavs from Dwarka. And we will perform the great Yagya. So your father and his fathers ascend into Indra's heaven. With quiet satisfaction that his most implacable enemy Jarasandha was dead, Krishan came home to Dwarka. The four quarters. In Indraprastha, <clears throat> excitement was in the air. The Rajsuya Yagya was on everyone's lips. From being some ruins in a wilderness of thorns, the city would soon be the focus of Bharat Varsha. Her emperor's capital, Vyas, arrived and he advised Yudhishthir on every detail of the sacrifice. You must first receive tribute from all the kings of Bharat. Bharat, let your brothers go forth and subdue the four quarters in your name. Only an emperor may perform the Raj Suye Yaga. Arjun elected to go north, Bhim east, Nakul west, and Sahadev to the south. No king could resist Arjun's advent. Most prefer to acknowledge Yudhishthir's sovereignty without a battle that they could only lose. As Arjun went north, the name Vijay, the victorious, followed his triumphal prog progress. Salav, the Shiv Bhagat, the sorcerer when Amba once chose, barred his way. Salav was a friend of Hans and Jarasan, of Rukmi and Shishupal, of the old conspiracy that had opposed Krishna from the start. But he was no longer the dauntless Kshatriya he had once been. Since news of Jarasan's death spread, every king of that alliance was forced to reconsider his position. It was as if their heart had been carved from them. Salav had heard that Bhim had torn Jarasan in two. He thought Arjun's arrival in his kingdom was a fine opportunity to take revenge on the Pandavas. It was not to be. Arjun won the day in humiliatingly brief encounter. Quite simply, no army on earth could stand before his unearthly archer. Salam also had to send Yudhishthir tribute, but he did not attend the Raj Surya. Nursing his shame, he swore to strike back. He was convinced Krishna was the moving spirit behind these founders. They were nothing without their blue fuzz and he was the real enemy. Salam swore he would avenge him on Krishna for Jarasan's death and his own defeat. And indeed, he would try, but not yet. Arjun marched on and came to the northernmost city in Bharatvarsh. The demon Narat, the son of Bhumi Devi, and the Varaha once ruled Pragyatush Putra in the mountains. Krishna killed Narat some years ago, and his son Bhagdat was now king in his father's city of sorcery, first between heaven and earth. Krishna has breached. Pragya Jyotishputra flying out of the sky on Garuda. Arjun arrived by torturous mountain trails with his army from Indraprastha. He sent word to Bhagdat that he should pay tribute to Yudhishthira or be prepared to fight him. And because he was a great Kshatriya himself, Bhagdat came out of his city to face Arjun in the valley in which Pragya Jyotishputra was going to. Eight days. The two fought eight nights. The mountains lit up with other suns risen over them. The light of livid Astras. Arjun extinguished Bhagdat's final mission and it fell in a shower of embers onto white fields. Bhagdat came before the Pandav and gave up the city of black crystal. Your father was my friend, Arjun, and Pandu could never have vanquished me in battle. You are a greater Kshatriya than he was. What shall I do for you? Before his own army, before the people of Pragijyotishputra, Arjun prostrated himself at Bhagdat's feet. The Pandav said humbly, Bhumi Putra, son of the earth, my brother Yudhishthira means to perform a Raj Suya Yagya in the dust. We shall be honored if you attend. Bhagdat embraced Arjun and cried, I shall be honored to come. Arjun left. Pragyjyotishputra, 
laden with the treasures many wrought in the elder ages bhagdath gave him the golden vessels of varun the very ones with which the lord of the ocean performed his own raj suya in time out of mind the infancy of the earth but bhagdath never forgave arjun for defeating him arjun rode towards ramgiri the mountain where ram had lived for some weeks of his exile the waters of its lake were sacred for precious sita had bathed in them it was on ramgiri that arjun first fought the trigarthas after a long and fierce encounter he had their measure and they fled from him but their enmity was to last until he killed them all in the war on the crack of the ages the trigarthas called themselves samastaks from them they swore to kill arjun and became a duryodhan's allies still further north went arjun and he saw the peak of meru before him in the virgin light of dawn it seemed the massif wrapped itself in a cloak of gold and crimson and then offered the light of the sun back to the star arjun stood chastened at the foot of meru he could feel the mountain spirit replete with the eternal brahm full of a sense of primordial time and deep peace arjun prostrated himself before golden meru from which the continents unfurl like petals from the corolla of a lotus at last the pandav wrenched himself away from the holiest mountain and turned back to the harsh world and its endless conflicts before he turned south he prayed fervently that he would have the fortune to return to this place some day when all his battles were over as he went he saw how the lower slopes of meru were overgrown with the verdant jambu vine in vivid bloom now with orange and vermilion flowers splashed everywhere in places like blood on a wounded warrior the jambu was especially sacred to the eldest mountain rishis some of whom lived for thousands of years the land of bharat is called jambu dweep by the sids and charans who are not mortals though he was a kshatriya arjun was always drawn to solitary places and to silence there still remained one mountain he must see before he went back gandh madan the fragrant one gatekeeper of devlok having paid homage to that gate's great spirit as well arjun turned home to indrapras to bring yudhishthir news that the nadan quarter had been conquered in his name and worship offered to meru and gandh madan arjun came home laden with treasure from all the kingdoms he passed through and he was called dhananjay winner of wealth we have seen that name used by lord krishna in bhagavad gita for arjun dhananjay meanwhile bhim had set out towards the countries of the rising sun through panchal he went came to mithila where its king resisted him but not for long soon carrying tribute from vanquished mithila he came to chedi his cousin shishupal's kingdom since the dark one had carried rukmani away on the day she was to marry that prince shishupal had been krishna's mortal enemy he had fought outside mathura 18 times in every army jarasand brought to krishna's gates and more than half an krishna had spared his cousin's life bhim expected shishupal to meet him with an army at the gates of chedi instead a warm reception awaited him the streets had been hung with garlands and perfumed with elephants ikor and incense to welcome the pandav in some surprise bhim allowed himself to be treated in the most effusive fashion it occurred to him that shishupal was only testing the wind after jarasand's death but such was the hospitality of the bull of chedi that bhim became convinced shishupal was also genuinely affectionate finally the time came to leave be sure to come to the rajsuya cousin how could i not come cried shishupal and bhim naively imagined a new bond had been forged he felt sure that krishna and shishupal could also bury their enmity on to koshal ayodhya and a hundred other lesser kingdoms rode the son of the wind 
they all paid him tribute for his brother in in the first some after battle which was inevitably short and one sided and others without resistance coming out to receive the kshatri at the gates yielding to him without a blow being struck at last bhim came to magad to hidden grivraj and jarasand san young sadev received him with respect and promised to be in under trust of the rajya bearing wealth from the eastern kingdoms bhim returned home to a hero's welcome from yudhishthira a month later sahadev came home as well carrying treasures from the south he had defeated dant vakra of jarasand's old conspiracy siranama wind and anuvind the brothers of avanti the neel of mahishmati in the deepest south of bharatvarsh then sahadev arrived on the shore of the southern sea and stood upon a lonely beach on a silvery night as the waves din the thunder at him across these waves lay the island of lanka where a noble king of an olden race of rakshasas still ruled that king vibhishan belonged to an age when men lived for thousands of years and were altogether more splendid than the men of these lesser days could imagine and vibhishan is one of the children genius just like hanuman ashwatthama so there are some chiranjeevis vibhishan was the rishi pulatse san and the legendary ravan's brother once when ravan held sita a prisoner in lanka vibhishan had begged his brother to return her to ram a doom would visit their island blinded by passion and deluded by the flattery of fawning courtiers ravan turned on vibhishan accusing him of cowardice and treachery vibhishan fled lanka and joined ram When Ravan died after a savage war, Ram crowned Vibhishan king in Lanka. With mighty Hanuman, Vibhishan also flew to Ayodhya in Kuber's Pushpak Viman for Ram's coronation. Long ago, Ram had left the world, but Chiranjeevi Vibhishan still ruled Lanka. When one night, Sahadev the Pandav came to the southern tip of Bharatvarsh and stood gazing across the surging foam with the wind whistling. around them we are going to end the reading here today and start from here next week om purnam ada purnam idam purnat purnam udachyate purnase purnam adaye purnam eva visheshyate om shanti shanti shanti